So the research on the economic impact of immigration are quite clear, but I think there are lots of public misperceptions about the um, effects on the U.S. economy. Okay? So when people think about uh, what an immigrant does, right, the first thing they think about is, you know, here's an immigrant that comes take a, takes a job, and that's a job that an American could have otherwise received. Okay? But the actual story is not that simple. Okay? It's often the case that immigrants take jobs that Americans don't want, and it's also often the case that Americans have a set of unique skills which have to do with language skills or uh, customer or client-facing skills that immigrants cannot easily reproduce. Right? And so what you end up seeing is immigrants sort into jobs that Americans otherwise would not be taking. A second, it, the story can get even better than that. Right? Uh, so rather than immigrants not just being substitutes for American workers, they may even be complements for those workers. Right? So one example would be an immigrant uh, willing, who's willing to take a low-paying job, right, say at the back of a restaurant washing dishes. Right? That makes the restaurant business more sustainable and viable and allows the rest restaurant owner to hire more American workers to be client-facing, say as maitre d's or waiters or managers. Right? It could also be the case that if immigrants are take, coming in and uh, taking low-paying fruit picking work, as they often do uh, in the US, that makes a vegetable business or a fruit business more viable, right? and that creates jobs for Americans downstream. Yeah. Um, it's also the case that a lot of immigrants come in and provide some basic home services and lowers those costs. So, for example, research shows that in cities that have higher fraction of immigrant workers, the cost of lawn mowing, the cost of babysitting, and other such services are lower. That frees up time for American workers and allows them to take advantage of their college education and go earn a salary outside the home. So it becomes a win-win both for the worker uh, who's American as well as the worker who's an immigrant. So I've worked on two different areas of immigration. So one was to look at the contribution made by foreign graduate students to the production of innovation in the US. And this is important for the economics of immigration because it turns out that a lot of the benefits from immigration stem from high-skilled immigrants. Right? Particularly in the US, our comparative advantage is in the creation of new products and new markets. Right? Even though the US has a trade deficit in virtually all sectors, that deficit is narrowest in the high-skilled sector uh, for high-tech products. And it's also the case that the secondary school system in the US is not at the uh, top levels of the world. Right? But if the U.S. is producing all these innovations, but our secondary school system isn't that great, it must be the case that somebody else is filling that gap. Right? And in, at the PhD level, so you, when you look at the data on who's receiving PhDs in the U.S., it turns out many of them were not native-born. Right? In fact, in engineering departments, over 50% of all PhDs allocated are to people who are not American-born. However, they come and get a PhD, often uh, they stay, either work in industry or in academia, right? And those uh, organizations or those firms produce innovations that then benefit the U.S. economy. Right? So I track this by looking at detailed data on who is receiving PhDs in the U.S. between 1950 and 2000, and then track relating that to the, the output, scientific output that comes out of those labs, so in the form of publications and citations but also in the form of patents and patent citations, which is a useful measure of innovation. Right? And what you find is both American and foreign-born students are important contributors to the production of innovation out of the US. Yeah, I think whenever there are economic pressures in a country, that's when there are pressures to blame something or someone, right? So often you see that it, that international trade gets blamed or um, immigrant workers get blamed. So the politics of this issue changes with different administrations. However, the economics remains the same and it's important for us to get the economics right because immigrants make a strong contribution to our economy and if we institute restrictions on the free movement of people and especially the movement of high-skilled people, there is a great risk that the economy slows down. So Japan has experienced this about 40, 50 years ago, they had, a period, they had periods of high growth when labor costs were still re relatively low in Japan. Right? But as labor costs increased, but b due to their stringent economic and immigration policies, they did not allow uh, immigrant workers to come in and replace the native workers. Right? It became harder and harder to find workers who would take the 
low-skilled or, or low-wage jobs. Okay? And as a result, uh, their economy slowed down and it experienced two lost decades of absolutely no growth. Okay? In the US, in contrast, uh, as the economy grows and um, labor costs increase, it keeps getting replaced by new low price labor that comes from other countries. So not just high skill but also low skill labor have an important contribution to play in making the U.S. economy tick and grow. Yeah, I think uh, if you look at the research on the topic of immigration systematically, right, and you st do a meta-analysis of all the hundreds of studies that have been done, it is very difficult to make a logical and economic ba based case for putting restrictions on the free movement of labor. Uh, however, it is the case that um, the emotions are run high and the politics become more difficult when there are segments of the economy here who are hurting. Right? So we do need to think a lot, lot more carefully about how, how the costs and benefits of immigration get distributed across society. Okay? So if an immigrant comes in, there is, you know, in some cases where an American worker who loses their job or uh, that puts a downward pressure on the wages of the American workers, right? So they bear the cost. However, overall, the economic research is clear that, it, that immigration contributes to overall efficiency increase in the economy as well as growth. Right? Now, if those same American workers who are losing their jobs are not seeing the benefits of that growth, then there's, of course, going to be uh, political pressure to put barriers to immigration. I think uh, one idea that we should be open to is to think about compromise solutions, which think of immigration policy as a spectrum rather than two discrete points, where either we're completely open uh, versus being completely closed. Okay? So uh, one problem I see right now is that countries like the US or Canada or Germany, right, when they let immigrants in, those immigrants have a clear path to full citizenship and all the rights that come with citizenship. Okay? And that may make native populations in those countries very nervous about letting people from a different culture, who speak a different language, come with different beliefs, right? um, uh, come with a different history, who come in and share not just the land temporarily, but also shares uh, an identity and citizenship with uh, with the native population. Okay? Uh, so there are lots of countries that have chosen middle-of-the-road policy options. So for example, you might allow immigrant workers to come and work temporarily, especially in categories of jobs and skill categories where there are uh, excess needs in the economy. Right? And in those cases, so, uh, so many Asian countries, Singapore, Malaysia, and also countries in the Middle East uh, like Kuwait, have uh, immigration policies of that nature, where there are much larger um, stocks of immigrants coming into those countries every year, but they stay temporarily, and the day they walk in, they know there is never going to be a clear path to citizenship here. Right? But because that policy then makes the native population of those countries less nervous, right? politically, what you see is that they are then allowing much larger stocks of immigrants to come into those countries. And in effect, they actually have a much larger, they make a lot, much larger contribution to human welfare by allowing up to like 75% of the population of those countries to be not native born. Right? So we might also, I'm, so I'm not suggesting that the US should follow the immigration policy of Kuwait. Right? You also have concerns about uh, violation of migrant rights in those countries, right? But the point of thinking of immigration policy as a full spectrum rather than discrete points is that you can choose whatever point in that spectrum you are most comfortable with. So the U.S. labor laws uh, and our views of human rights should be applied and maybe we choose a different point on the spectrum where we care a lot more about migrant rights, right? But at the same time, that opens up the option for us to let in a lot more people who then contribute to our economy and in exchange, we also make a larger contribution to the betterment of human life all over the world.